so everyone knows. This meeting is being recorded. Oops, doing a little feedback. There. there we go. All right, so welcome everyone. And thank you, Kimberly, for the introduction. And thank you and our student team who have been um, working hard to get this workshop series um, scheduled here. So I think you can all see the poll. So feel free to fill that out while I'm giving the introductor introduction to the session tonight. But I just wanted to add as well that um, this workshop series came out of some end of season meetings that we had with farmers um, a few, a couple, I think it was a year and a half ago or a year, maybe two years ago now, um, in end of 2020 or 2021, um, as we were doing our end of season meetings with new entry farmers, folks were like, we really wanna learn about grant writing um, and like trying to get more resources for our farm businesses as we move forward and graduate from the program. So just wanna say we listen to what farmers want and we put in some proposals and got some funding and it does take a while. That's one of the lessons that we'll talk about here. Sometimes you put in a proposal and you don't hear back from a while and then it takes a while to enter the contracting process. So things take time, um, but if you're successful, then you can obviously accomplish more work um, without the extra resources. So um, thank you to the farmers for suggesting this series and thank you to the funder, which I'll talk about in a second for funding it. But this is part of our Investing in Your Farm Accessing Grants and Loans workshop series. All right, so now I gotta figure out how to advance my slides that isn't very obvious now. Okay, so if folks want to um, introduce yourself in the chat, um, please feel free to do that. Feel free to rename yourself, add your pronouns if you'd like, um, where you're coming from. And just to keep the feedback uh, low, we just ask if people can keep yourself muted. Um, if you do have questions, you're welcome to add them to the chat. You're welcome to raise your hand and we'll just uh, acknowledge them and uh, get that going as we um, move along in the presentation. And as, as I said, this is gonna be recording, uh, recorded, so your video is optional, but it's always more fun to present when you can see people's faces. So if you're willing to keep that on, we appreciate it. So just a quick background. Again, my name is Jennifer Hashley. I'm the director of the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. We are located in Beverly, Massachusetts um, on ancestral, traditional, and contemporary and unceded lands of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts people. And our mission is really to improve our local and regional food systems by training the next generation of farmers. And we also have programs that help um, get that food to other folks who like to consume it. So our main programs are our farmer training programs, which include all of our workshops and courses, um, our crop production course, our business planning courses, and our incubator farm program, and the workshops like these that we offer to help support farmers. We also support farmers through our food hub, which helps aggregate and distribute the farmers' products, um, both our incubator farmers and our graduates. Um, and those products go to a CSA program, food access partnerships, and institutional partnerships. We also run a national initiative that which helps um, other programs like ours across the country run incubator farms and apprenticeship training programs to network and share information and um, best practices across the country. So that's mostly what New Entry does. Um, we're really excited and grateful to the Northeast Risk Extension Risk Management Program and USDA for supporting this work. They've funded many of our workshop series over the years. So just wanna give them a shout out for making this available to give us the time to put this together, to engage our farmer speakers and develop the resources that will go along with these workshop trainings. So thanks to them for funding this. Um, and as Kimberly mentioned, um, and you'll learn through this presentation on grants, you know, there's no such thing as free money necessarily. Um, with grants comes responsibility for reporting and documenting outcomes of that. So that is why we do ask you to fill out the initial questions in the poll and the survey questions, because our funders want to make sure that what they're investing in actually makes a difference. So we really appreciate your time when you do fill out those evaluation forms. Um, so our goals for today in this Grant Writing 101 workshop are for you to learn about grant writing resources for your farm, to share lessons and best practices around what should your strategy be, what could your priorities be, um, where to get some support if you need that, um, application tips and tricks, get all your questions answered and hopefully access new resources and help you have more success in supporting your farm financing and investment goals. So to kick us off to begin with, um, I'm just hoping um, I can get some examples from folks on the call. I'm assuming that you're here because you might be looking to fund something on your farm. So if folks could just take a minute and say, what is it you're looking to fund? 
what do you guys want to, what are you hoping that that grants will pay for or cover? Anyone want to share? You're welcome to unmute yourself or you can put some ideas in the chat. Anything in particular? So I'm happy to share. My name is Beth Began, and um, I'm actually helping out a nonprofit. So I don't know how relevant. I mean, I want to learn more about grants so I can help this nonprofit, but I don't personally run a farm. So I'm looking to help with, um, you know, general operating funding to help grow um, more food for the, for this farm, for this urban garden. And, um, and just learn about, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm new to this and, um, just learn about the different resources. I mean, they need, you know, soup to nuts help to build out their, uh, organization. So. Great. Thank you, Beth. Sounds like a great project. General operating funds are always <laughs> really necessary and sometimes yes. tricky to figure out how to fund because you got to talk right. about all the non-sexy stuff that people don't always right. love to fund, right? The things right. that make the organization or the farm go. Yeah, great, thanks for sharing. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll share. Uh, my name is Randall, I'm a beekeeper. And so it might be different from some of the other farmers. I'm not sure what other people are doing, but I don't like own land myself. I kind of like rent or squat places, but I'm looking for general operating costs, of course. But also I learned some like a uh, honeybee, like queen breeding stuff last year. And that'll be like a new part of my operation for the next couple of years. Um, and I feel like I could get some money for that. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Thanks. Or I'm hoping. I'm hoping that's a thing, but. Cool. Anyone else? All right. Well, there's a lot of different things we could all there's use. My... For. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Murray, were you adding, adding something? Shared things in the chat. Um, there. Oh, great. So, um, Gabrielle would like to look at redirecting ag waste streams into the mushroom industry. Cool. Great. Awesome. Well, I'm sure we all have lots of diverse interests in um, and where, what funding could support our different objectives and things. So, just something to you know, this is one of the first things to figure out, I would say, when you're thinking about writing a grant, is it what are you actually trying to fund? I mean, that's pretty basic. It sounds obvious, but having a really clear idea of the project, the cost that you might need to support, and, you know, what's your timeline and when do you need money? Because sometimes the grant may or may not be the right thing um, to support what you want to do. So I just wanted to start out, too, by defining what a grant is versus what a loan is. Um, and that's really important to understand the difference. So, you know, grants are sometimes considered quote unquote free money. Like I said, there's usually not, no free lunch necessarily, but it's money that you don't have to pay back. Um, usually it's taxable. It depends on the situation. If you're a for-profit farm and you receive grant money from certain entities, it could be considered taxable income. So, that's just something to consider as well um, if you're prepared to pay the extra income tax on that extra income. Often grants are restricted to specific projects, like they may fund capital equipment, they may fund a training program, they may fund general operating, they may fund you know, a very specific thing, land purchase, whatever it is, but often that's very, you know, is usually spelled out in the RFA. So it has to be something generally pretty specific to the funder and what they're looking to fund. Most grants have reporting requirements, um, whether that's financial reporting, invoices, documentation that you spent the money the way that you said it was, and that there's some kind of outcome associated with what the money was um, designated for. With a lot of those state and federal programs that we might talk about, um, sometimes you'll have a site visit even of the funder coming to make sure that you did purchase the thing that you were supposed to purchase with the money. Um, and sometimes they're 
you know, on a cost reimbursement basis. So unless you do the thing and put it together or build your high tunnel or buy the tractor, um, you know, that may need to be verified before you're eligible for that reimbursement. So some grants you pay the money up front and then you get reimbursed for it. So do you have the funding to pay for that um, in advance is a good question. Um, a lot of times grants are pretty competitive, that's obvious, but usually funders get sometimes 10, 10 times more applicants than they have the resources to fund. So um, they're really gonna try to select the best quality applications um, so that they can leverage their resources effectively. And some grants, even though it's free money, might require you to contribute something as well. So there could be a cost share requirement. Sometimes it's five, 10, 20, a hundred percent. So if you're gonna get a $10,000 grant, you have to put in $10,000 or some kind of match. Um, sometimes the match can be in kind. Sometimes it can be cash dollars. It just depends, but sometimes funders wanna see that you have skin in the game. On contrast to loans, obviously it is borrowed money. You have to pay it back usually with interest, usually there's some kind of vetting process, whether it's a credit check or risk assessment or something to get the loans. I say that because sometimes you as a farmer may have to do both at once, especially if there's a cost reimbursement process and you don't have the funds to do the thing that you're asking the grant money for, you may need to borrow money to be able to do the thing you're getting the grant for and then pay yourself back when you get reimbursed from the grant. So just think about um, whether that is your situation or not. And you know, it may be a two-step process. All right, so I'm just gonna go into a little laundry list of grant writing tips. And again, the slides will be made available to you. Um, the, this is being recorded, so you can always come back to this. But you know, when you think about grant writing, again, what I asked earlier, like what is what's your why? Um, what are you trying, what are you trying to do and why are you trying to do it? So what are you gonna use the money for? What's the bigger picture issue that you're trying to solve? Why does someone want to give you money? You know, giving someone money and these grant programs, you know, most places that are funding projects and giving money to people for different things have a group of stakeholders that they're trying to accomplish a shared mission with. So whether it's a nonprofit organization giving funding or a government entity or others, like they have a mission of what they're trying to accomplish with the money. And so does your why match their why? Are you trying to use the money to help whatever this other big picture is um, of the organization that's doing it? And so what's your case for support or what's your, what's your rationale for this? And, and what's your compelling need that you're trying to, to establish and fund? Obviously, are you eligible? Um, this is a big one. A lot of times um, people get really far along in the practice and uh, in the process of writing a grant and they're not really even eligible or they really don't even meet the criteria for the grant. And so really looking through um, that and figuring out, are you the type of person that the grantor is, is imagining um, fits within the program that they're trying to fund and is the project that you're offering something that they're going to be excited about. So make sure you meet the criteria to apply if you're not sure if you're eligible, ask. Um, you know, usually the criteria are pretty clear, but if you feel like you're in a gray area somewhere, it's definitely a good idea to figure out before you get too far down the process and waste a lot of time. Oftentimes, um, federal and state programs will have information sessions about their program, and they usually cover the eligibility criteria pretty clearly because they also don't want to waste anyone's time. So make sure that you attend those info sessions if offered and figure out if you are eligible. If the funding is to support a farmer that has, you know, five or more years of experience and owns their land and you don't have either of those, you're probably not eligible. Um, so it's just, you know, usually it's cut and dried. Sometimes there are questions. So just make sure that that's a pretty, pretty clear piece that you start with. Um, other things, you know, that are just good practices, if you are going to be asking for funding, do you have support um, for your idea? A lot of times funders want to make sure that this is not just funding you or your organization or your farm, but like what's the greater public good? Again, going back to the number one, what's your why? Do you have other community support? Um, are you also solving you know, other kind of key issues in the community? Can you get others involved in, in what you're doing? Can they write letters of support for you? Can they you know, can you get evidence or statistics or other things about how this is going to benefit more than just you or your farm or your organization? What's the bigger, bigger reach of this funding? 
And maybe there's someone that you can partner with. If you have community support, depending on the type of grant that it is, you know, you may be able to support more than just your idea, but also help someone else accomplish their goals. And oftentimes partnerships look a lot more attractive to funders than just a one-off, um, you know, single beneficiary. So get your peeps together and figure out how you can get support. That could be your customers. It could be, you know, community members, your, your town, whatever it is that you can show that support from. The other thing that's important is to really know who the funder is. Um, you know, who's, who is the person with the money bucks um, that's gonna give this money away? You know, what are, what are their priorities? Um, who are the people that they've funded in the past? You know, a lot of times funders will list their prior grantees on their websites um, or it's public knowledge. If it's a public funder, those are posted in databases or you can request that information. Really helpful to look at the list of projects that have been funded who they funded, what types of things did they fund, what were those descriptions of those projects. Sometimes funders will put summaries of funded projects on their website, it could give you an idea again of language you could be using, um, you know, how you describe the project, things like that. So doing that research about who the funder is and what their priorities are, what they funded in the past, what their motivation is, it can also help you think about your case for support and how you write that up. This might be obvious, but give yourself enough time to do all of this. Be really proactive. Um, a lot of times, you know, it takes a long time to put everything together, to do the research, to prepare, to, you know, craft something to respond to all the pieces of the application. And so setting that realistic time frame, making sure that you know if, if when do these things usually come out, if this is something that you've been looking at for a while or you've researched and you're like, oh, that's interesting, but I don't know. You know, when's, when is the request for proposal going to be available and can you start preparing for the process of applying ahead of time? Um, if these things are offered year after year, maybe you set a calendar just like, oh, I know this generally comes out in April. It's my busy time. So I'm going to get my ducks in a row so that when April comes, I'm ready or I practically have the thing written um, in time so that it's not, not such a crunch time. But definitely don't wait till the last minute. Um, there, <laughs> setting realistic goals is also really important. Making sure that your application is achievable and well defined. Is it unique? And again, you know, the funders they're going to give their own sniff test of these things. Like, if it sounds too good to be true that you're going to do all these things for this money, they can kind of see through that a lot of times. So, really being realistic about what you're asking for, what can be accomplished, a realistic budget. Um, so that you can, you know, really accomplish what you say you're going to do with the money. There's nothing worse than promising too much and not being able to deliver because it, it doesn't look good for you or for the funder that chose your project over someone else's. And the money does matter. Um, again, oftentimes, you know, it's important to set a realistic budget to do your homework and make sure that you've gotten quotes, that things are really well planned, it's cost effective, you've, you know, researched this and it's feasible. You know where you're going to get the supplies from. You know, a lot of times funders will request the quotes with the application, but they're going to really scrutinize the budget and make sure that the things you're asking for in your budget match what you say you're going to do in the narrative. And so those things also need to align really well. It's easy. It might be easier if it's just a piece of equipment, but if you're putting together, you know, a research project or funding an organization, you know, all the pieces that go into the budget also need to be you know, justified in the budget justification or in the narrative to some degree. And so making sure that, again, if there's match that's required, that should be included in the budget. Um, if there's community benefits or community in kind or other services, that those are all spelled out effectively in your budget. And then as you're writing your application, make sure that you're turning on the charm a little bit. You know, you want to not be being overly... <laughs> Um, embellishing things or being too exaggerating things too much, but like make sure that your passion about what you're doing and your enthusiasm and your ideas are exciting and that you're writing about it with some enthusiasm, that, that your ideas are clear and concise, but that your project is really exciting and it's going to have a huge difference and make an impact in the community and what you're trying to do. So make sure that comes through and how you write in your application without going overboard is always helpful. I think it's, you know, these reviewers are going to read a lot of different proposals. So how do you help what you write um, to stand out and help catch their attention? So being really excited about what you're proposing and have, you know, backing it up with data and facts and other things is also super helpful. 
And then revise, revise, revise. Um, I think it's always great to have a second set of eyes on a proposal. Um, just make sure you use spell check, avoid errors, you know, try not to be vague, unclear. You know, make sure somebody proofreads this to make sure that it makes sense and that you're actually following the instructions of the RFA and that it doesn't have a lot of errors in it. There's nothing more, you know, creating less confidence in some in someone to give them a lot of money if they can't bother to proofread or spell check or you know, write clearly and concisely in terms of and answer all the questions and follow the instructions. So making sure that you really get another set of eyes on it is very much recommended. And again, making sure that you submit on time and, and avoiding the last minute um, with all of these things is super, super important. So that's just a general thing. I know this is small, but just to kind of highlight a few other things, um, I've said most of these things, but if I don't say it enough and you don't hear it enough, tonight, um, the most important thing that you can do when applying for a grant is read the grant applications and instructions. I mean, that should be very basic, but so many people read a section of it or some of it, but not all of it. And it sometimes can be very boring, especially federal register <laughs> uh, advertised requests for proposals are really long and jargony, but they contain a lot of important information. And sometimes there are little details that will cost you the grant if you don't read the whole grant application instructions from start to finish. You could miss a required document that you have to upload, some kind of you know, other piece of information or data that you don't have that you didn't include in the proposal, and that could be the difference between getting the funding or not. If you need certain uh, registrations or, you know, tax identification numbers or, you know, receipt, you know, any different kinds of registrations that sometimes federal grants require. Sometimes those can take a long time to get. So doing that, following those instructions, making sure you leave enough time um, to do all of those components is also really important. So vigilantly follow the application instructions. If it's really unclear and you're not sure what something means in a proposal, oftentimes there is a point person that you can call and ask questions to. If you didn't get to attend the information session or the webinar that was offered about the program, you know, try to reach out to the person and see if they're able to ask questions. Just to say, sometimes funders will not respond to questions once the request for applications is posted. So that can be tricky. So if you know there's a program that you have your eye on and you wanna get feedback or input or something from the funder about, hey, is this a good idea? Would this be a good fit? Sometimes you might have to do that before the application is actually live because sometimes funders have, to be fair, they don't want to, once the RFA is live, they don't want to be giving some people information without others. Or there's a very public way for you to ask questions. You submit it to an email address and those funders may be required to post the question and the answer publicly. So again, some all programs are different. People may be willing to answer questions, but if not, try to do your best to get, you know, if you're if you're unclear, try to get as clear as you can because that will help you be more successful. The other thing I would say too, and um, sometimes I forget to do this as well, but if the request for proposal has the review criteria, the scoring process, how you will be judged or evaluated in the application, make sure that you're writing your application to meet those review criteria. Use their same language. Like if there's a section that's gonna be worth 20 points, make sure you have a section header in your narrative that says, this is the thing I'm responding to. You know, it needs to flow with your narrative, but. Um, make sure it's really clear to the reviewers that you are addressing their review criteria, that you've hit on all of those points. Because sometimes with federal grants, I've done this a million times, you know, you're scored and you get a 90 out of 100 and they're only funding people with a 91 and above. And it's really hard to be like, where did I miss that point? Um, so that's really important to just pay attention to that review criteria and really make sure that you're you're writing the proposal to meet that criteria. And again, I said this earlier, but just being clear about your purpose, your goals, and your objectives. Um, they should be specific and re realistic. A lot of times we'll ask for a timeline. Make sure that you include that timeline of what you're going to do when and how you're going to you know, accomplish the project that you're proposing within that amount of time. 
you know, research your costs, be clear and realistic with your budget and your schedule. Um, sometimes things are unpredictable. Once you get the grant, it's easier to change your timeline. It might be easier to change your budget, but it's got to be pretty well defined at the application process. And then once you're awarded and you have a signed contract, if there's room to negotiate with a timeline because of things out of your control, that's always a conversation that you can have. But try to be as realistic as you can up front. I think too, as you're writing and developing your narrative, you know, how do you tie your project to what you want to do now? Have you been successful in the past? And then how is this, you know, try to include in your narrative, how is this project, like, again, I said, have other community benefits, but like, how will this help leverage what you're going to do in the future? How will this help you be sustainable as a farm into the future? How will you leverage this investment in your business? again, to have more community benefit, but to grow your farm, to be better able to serve the community in the long run. So try to make those connections between what you're doing now, what you've done, or what you've done in the past, what you're doing now, where you see yourself going. Um, that's always exciting for people to see how you're growing as a business or an organization and to have them understand where their investment fits into that timeline and that picture. So if that's appropriate, again, you're following the instructions, if there isn't a good place to put that in a narrative because they're you know, only wanting you to respond to these questions with this much word and character limits, then sometimes you can't include these things. But if it's a more general narrative, it's good to try to make that case that this is a, an important investment at this time and this is how it's gonna carry the organization and the, and the farm forward. Again, um, include letters of support if allowed and appropriate for the, for the applications um, and figure out again how how can those things, um, how are other people gonna benefit from the work that you're doing? If there's a place in your proposal to put graphics to clarify what you're trying to do um, with a, maybe a map, here's where the farm is located, here's where the project is gonna be, this is the field. You know, Is there any data that you can show, graphics, pictures, anything like that that you can include to help clarify the project and exactly what you're doing? Sometimes the format of the, the application doesn't allow for that, but if it does, um, that's something helpful to have. You know, do you have maps of your farm and you know places of where you're gonna put the project? There's lots of tools out there you can use from Google Earth, things like that to kind of mock up um, what you're planning to do exactly on the overlay of your, of your property and where it's gonna go. Uh, again, I said proofread and edit. And then lastly, you know, learn from rejection. If, if something happens and you don't get, get the grant the first time around, um, at least a lot, with a lot of public grants, um, they, you can do an Information Act request, Freedom of Information Act, and request your scores or reviewer feedback. Usually that's public information with other foundations or programs. They may or may not if they get you know, 500 applications, they may not give feedback on every one, but if, if that's an opportunity for you to talk to a program officer or get your reviewer feedback or scores if you were not funded, you, know, you can learn a lot from that process to figure out how you can be better prepared the next time around. Or maybe your project just wasn't a good fit and you won't waste your time doing, you know, submitting it again, but that feedback is really, really valuable. And then try again, if you don't succeed the first time, take that feedback and try, try again. Um, I've certainly had that experience of having to apply two, three, four, five times before I finally gotten um, the grants that we're trying to get to support our work. So it's not easy, it can be demoralizing, you can feel like you wasted a lot of time, but sometimes that's just what happens and um, you know, just keep the faith that you'll find either the right funder, the right project or the right timing and hopefully it will happen. So any questions about that at this point, I'll just pause for a brief second. I don't, I'm not looking at the chat because I'm talking, but um, that was just some quick, quick overviews and tips. But let me know. Otherwise, just some helpful resources and documents that you might want to have in your wheelhouse as you start thinking about applying for grants and things. Um, you know, if you're applying for any of the federal programs uh, that we'll be covering in later workshop series, you're going to need to have um, a registration with the USDA Farm Service Agency and be assigned a farm track number. So there's a great little cheat sheet on how to do that or easy steps to get started with um, FSA. So you can get that farm track number that opens the door for a lot of different USDA programs, um, farm programs. 
you probably will need to have a federal employer identification number and some kind of business status um, if you are an entity and have that documentation ready. You can apply for a federal EIN number online very easily. Having a recent tax documents or financial statements is helpful. Federal grants either require a DUNS number or they've moved to this new, um, sorry, I should have updated this slide. Um, there's a new universal um, identification number that the federal government is using that you can apply for. I'll put that in the chat in a minute. Um, if you also are a landowner or are renting or leasing land, having proof of land security and tenure, whether it's a copy of your lease or license or MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, or other written documentation that you have permission to access that land. Um, some grants require some kind of security because if they're going to fund a capital improvement or infrastructure project, they want to make sure that you're going to be able to have permission from the landowner or um, other entity that you have control of the property for the amount of time that the thing they're going to invest in will happen or that you have permission to do it in the first place. And then Jeff's going to talk a little bit about this later, but just making sure that you have a comprehensive and updated business plan um, for yourself, which lots of pieces, parts of your business plan could easily be transferred over to a grant application, but make sure that you have the financials and the, the capital budget um, constantly as part of your business plan. As you see opportunities, then you'll already be ready with your prioritization of what it is that you're looking for. Um, just some other quick grant resources. There is a guide, a USDA guide to federal grant programs. Um, so that's a great resource if you want to familiarize yourself with all the federal grant programs that are out there. Um, the SARE program, the Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, has a great tip sheet for writing proposals. Um, there's the MDAR, the Mass Department of Ag Resources, on their website has an A to Z listing of all of their grant programs. And I think Chris is going to enumerate some of those in his presentation. And we're going to have a whole series of workshops on some of the different MDAR programs. If you're a dairy farmer, there's a cool um, dairy decision tool on navigating all the grant opportunities online. And then there are some places you can turn to um, to get support with writing grants. So sometimes conservation districts, I've heard in other parts of the country, I don't know that we have too many with a lot of capacity in Massachusetts, but sometimes conservation districts have grant writing support in their districts. Um, sometimes you can tap into SCORE, which is an association of retired business executives. It's a volunteer program. And those folks are there to be helpful to you to look at, um, to either review applications or help you think through what would be a, a good, you know, give you good feedback on your plan and, and grant opportunity. And we're gonna hear from Chris with Farm Credit in a minute, but they offer some support. And then there's a fee-for-service program out there called Farm Raise. Um, and they write grants for farmers and charge a fee for that, but um, it might be something that you want to look into if you're curious. And then I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there's lots of federal, you know, different programs that might interest you, different state programs, different private programs from National Farmer Coalition. Their farmer grant cycle just closed on January 13th, so sorry we missed that one. <laughs> Uh, American Farmland Trust has a New England micro farmer grants. Um, they kind of change it a little bit for 2023, but you might want to look at their website and subscribe to their updates. So when that comes out, you could be ready. Um, if you're raising livestock, there's a Food Animal Concerns Trust. They also just closed their cycle on January 10th, and they've got over 700 applications. So there are these other like very farmer specific grants out there, but they're likely to be highly, highly competitive. So again, thinking about what your ask is, how you're gonna present your, your case for support and all the other things that we just mentioned. Um, so that's what I have for now. Um, and I'd love to introduce Chris and Jeff and then turn it over to them for their presentations and then we'll move on from there. So um, thank you to Chris for, for being here tonight. He's with Farm Credit East and he's the Director of Knowledge Exchange and the Manager of the Farm Start Program, which is kind of their early stage uh, beginning farmer lending program. And he does a lot of different things there, wears lots of hats and speaks all over <laughs> New England these days, but um, really helps folks with outreach. And he is also uh, you know, a farmer himself and has worked with his family's um, greenhouse and nursery business. So um, thank you, Chris. And let me just uh, introduce Jeff before I turn it over to you, Chris. And then after Chris goes, then Jeff will jump on 
Um, Jeff Cole from the Carrot Project. Um, he's also a ninth generation farmer from Sutton Mass, has a lot of experience. He used to be the executive director of the Mass Farmers Market um, group there for 20 plus years and helped found the Boston Public Market and been very involved in other national farmers market coalitions and been involved a lot here with Farm Bureau and the Mass Food Policy Council and the Mass Food Systems Collaborative and then um, yeah, just doing a lot of great work. So we're really grateful to have both Jeff and Chris here. And so um, I don't know if we wanna pause now and answer any questions that I have, but we can come back to this. So I'll, I'll let Chris and Jeff go and then we can open it up for questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to you guys. Okay, so do, what, do you want me to go next? Yes, please, 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 please. Okay, let me share my screen here. And let me know if you can see that okay. Yeah, looks good. Okay, so um, as Jennifer said, my name is Chris Lawton. I'm, I'm with Farm Credit East. Um, I'm gonna talk about grants and grant writing, and I'm gonna begin with just a brief introduction of Farm Credit East for those of you who are not familiar with us. Um, so we are a, a farmer-owned financial services cooperative. Uh, so what that means is that we provide um, capital to farmers, um, commercial fishermen, and forest product producers in New England, New York, and New Jersey. Um, as I mentioned, we are farmer owned. We have 18,000 customers who own us and um, our uh, earnings go back to our customers in the form of uh, patronage dividends. Um, we have about 500 in staff and about 25 branch offices throughout the region. Um, as you can see, we have a pretty diverse loan portfolio. It kind of mirrors the um, distribution of farms in the region. Um, dairy is our biggest sector, mostly because of Vermont and New York. Um, and then uh, it's a you know wide variety of other types of farms. Uh, many of our customers are uh, small farmers. We have a lot of part-time farmers, and uh, many of our farmers sell direct to the consumer. Um, in addition to um, lending, which is our core business. We also have a number of financial services. Um, we won't, I won't um, belabor this, but we, um, we do offer a number of um, services, including consulting, record keeping, uh, tax prep. We do more, almost 10,000 tax returns a year for farmers, um, pay, paychecks for, for employees, um, a number of other services. So uh, moving on to grants. Um, you'll find that my um, advice is probably very similar to Jennifer's. Uh, we were kind of talking in our, our pre-call that we had that uh, we did our presentations independent of each other uh, without looking at each other's work and uh, arrived at roughly about the same spot, which is, which is good. Uh, you know, I, I was saying at least we're not like contradicting each other, uh, you know, and coming up with wildly different recommendations. So uh, that's a good thing. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to say uh, you want to consider whether it makes sense to apply for a grant or not. Um, so things to consider are the compatibility of the grant. You know, if you find out about a grant, think, oh, that's great. Um, you know, is it compatible with your business model, where you want your business to go uh, and your plans? Uh, what is the administrative burden? And that includes applying, but it doesn't end with applying. Um, because as Jennifer mentioned, many um, grants do have strings attached. There may be significant record keeping or accounting requirements, and there may be final reporting or outcome obligations where you have to uh, submit a final report of what you did with the funding. Um, think about the likelihood of the award or the funding. Um, does my application align with the goals and spirit of the grant? You know, what is the grant maker trying to get it, you know, get at for a goal with their grant money? And is that compatible with what you want to do? Um, and then finally, is the juice worth the squeeze, so to speak? Is the potential funding and the likelihood of funding uh, worth it for the work involved? There are some grants out there that might be um, such a reach and so much work that it may not be worth it for you to pursue them. Um, there's other grants, and, and I don't want to kind of scare people off from grants with these presentations because um, there's a wide, wide range of grants out there, and not all of them are as complicated as kind of what we're talking about. 
Um, what hap what tends to happen is the the size of the award, the complexity of the grant tends to go with the size of the grant. Um, so there are small grants out there, like Jennifer mentioned, the American Farmland Trust Micro Grant for New England farmers. Um, those are, I think, five to ten thousand dollars max in that range, and they're and they're easy and quick to apply for. Um, so, you know, why not go for them? You don't need to uh, produce a twenty-page, you know, uh, you know, complex application for it. Um, you know, other grants like the grants that. Jennifer herself applies for for new entry sustainable farming to run their operations might be $100,000 or more and those are often quite complex and require a great deal of work and a great deal of administration and record keeping and uh, final reporting so you know again the complexity and the and the um, the, the burden if you will uh, with grants tends to go along with the, the size of the award. So another question about applying for a grant, um, think about the goals. Usually there is a broader goal, um, you know, sort of societal goal, if you will, that the grant maker has. Many goals, many uh, grants are funded with taxpayer dollars and they're trying to achieve a sort of um, benefit for society at large. Um, and so it's not necessarily about you. Um, you know, it's, it's important to write when you're writing a grant application, be genuine, you know, write about yourself and your operation and how you want to use it, but you also want to speak in a meaningful way to what the goals of the grant maker have with their um, RFP. So it's often includes things like, depending on the grant, may include things like uh, supporting beginning farmers, or it may include things like uh, energy efficiency or open space preservation or economic development uh, or pr promoting specific practices. A grant may be for uh, organic transition or for uh, doing, you know, converting to uh, carbon sequestration or no-till farming or, you know, there's there's often an, an a overarching goal that the grant maker is trying to achieve and you want to speak to, you know, how you getting that grant is going to help them achieve that goal that they're trying to get, see, you know, reflected. Um, again, I mentioned grants very widely, so don't be discouraged, I have uh, a series of steps that I'm, that I'm gonna give to you know being successful in writing grants. Not every grant requires all of those steps. Some grants are you know simpler and easier to do, um, but if you're gonna apply for you know the big ones, um, it makes sense to go with all the advice that, that Jennifer gave and that I'm gonna give. Um, and it, it also often goes in uh, the complexity along with the sort of the size of the grant maker, if you will. Um, there's a lot of nonprofit grants. Those are usually simple. Then you get to state government or regional. They're usually more complex. And then, of course, when the federal government gets involved, of course, they have to make everything super complicated a lot of times, uh, whether it needs to be or not, right? <laughs> uh, so my number one rule for running a successful grant application is follow directions. Um, you would be surprised at how many grant applications don't do this. Um, you know, every almost every grant, or I think every grant, has an RFP, a request for proposal, or a request for response that details what the grant is, what you have to do to apply, who's eligible, all that stuff. Read it thoroughly. Make a checklist. Uh, observe deadlines. Allow adequate time. Um, some grants require letters of support or references or things like that. Um, give your referrers or your supporters time to respond to you. Um, at Farm Credit East, we write a lot of letters of support for um, constituents or stakeholders that are applying for various grants of various types. And one of my kind of pet peeves is I get at like 4.30 on a Friday uh, as I'm you know, eyeing the door, um, a request for a letter of support that needs to be in by the end of the day uh, because the grant's got to meet a deadline. And uh, I often kind of pull my hair out and I'm thinking like, how long has this person known about this? Um, you know, give your, give your supporters or your referees or, you know, whatever you're, you're asking others to do for you, give them time to do it. Um, some grants will have a page or award limit. Um, I recently applied for a, uh, was part of a coalition of people that applied for a big federal grant 
Um, and to give you an idea of the scope of some of these things, we're applying for 50 million bucks. Um, now, we're not going to keep that if we get it. Um, actually, Farm Credit East doesn't even have a direct role in it, so we wouldn't get any funding at all. We were just kind of helping support the application. Um, most of the funding would be passed through to farmers and service providers in the form of sub awards. So very complex federal grant um, dollars. Um, in this case, that grant had a page limit where the your your um, response could not exceed uh, twenty pages, and you know so um, given the complexity of the grant, you know the size of this, that was actually kind of constraining on us, and we had to go through and edit down a lot of what we were going to say in our response because we don't want to exceed the page limit. And when you get to big competitive grants like that. Some grant, you know, grant committees vary. Some will, you know, go with the sort of spirit and say, well, this is a great application and they're over by a page. So I'm not going to be a stickler about that. But others will just look at that as a way to weed out some of the extraneous applications that they get. You know, if they're getting like three times the, the you know, if they're three times oversubscribed and what they can award, they're going to go through and be and just weed out the ones that didn't follow the directions. So I, you know, um, I spent a lot of time in this slide. I'm going to go through quicker on the others, but that's the number one thing that I that I have to say. Um, be prepared to put the work in. Um, if you do use a grant writer, remember you're not delegating it to them. You're bringing a partner. Um, they can't write the grant without you. Um, at Farm Credit East, we do offer grant writing services for a fee. And again, one of the things that's frustrating sometimes is farmers will ask us to do a grant for them. And then that's like the last we hear from them. And they're an integral part of it. We need collaboration between the, you know, the farmer and the grant writer if it's gonna work. Um, research, again, thoroughly read the RFP, FAQs, know what you're eligible for, know what's eligible for funding. You know, some grants explicitly will not fund capital spending. Um, they'll only fund operating expenses. Other grants are the opposite way. They'll only fund capital spending, you know, so match what you're trying to do with what the restrictions are. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out to the grant maker because oftentimes they're not always, but oftentimes they're happy to answer questions. Um, I've been actually pleasantly surprised, to be honest, with um, the responsiveness of USDA in many cases um, with grants and and you know, getting back to me with answers of things. Um, speak to the grant maker's goals. Um, you know, tie your application to the desired outcomes that they're trying to achieve. Uh, tell a story that speaks to their objectives, offer solutions, not just problems. Um, this is a big one. Don't try to put a square peg in a round hole. Um, in other words, don't try to make an unrelated project fit the grant that's available. Sometimes people really want to um, you know, do whatever on their farm or their nonprofit or that sort of thing. And they're trying to sort of bend and twist a grant to meet the project that they want to fund. Um, and mismatched applications like that are usually unsuccessful. Um, if, if you don't fit the, the grant, it's best to, you know, it's sometimes best to just not apply and find one that's more applicable to you. Um, this is a big one and Jennifer mentioned it. Look at previously funded projects. That gives you a great idea of what the grant maker likes and what they wanna fund. Um, and also you may be able to avoid reinventing the wheel. Um, I'm on a grants committee myself and um, we get a lot of requests for like the same thing over and over different years or they, they wanna create a curriculum to train farmers in X and I'm like, we funded this like five, five years in a row with five different organizations. Can't we just like share the curriculum with this applicant and save all the money? Um, you know, so avoid reinventing the wheel. If, if something that you want to do, you know, that's not like a tangible um, investment, you know, if it's like a curriculum or, or something, you know, a presentation or something, maybe you can just use something that's been previously developed using grant funds. Um, Realistic budgets and timelines, I won't belabor that, but that's important. Um, keep your projections reasonable, watch your match. Um, 
you know, know what you're getting into, you may be legally obligated to that match. Once you put it in the grant, if you get, if you get the, the award, you may be on the hook for whatever you said you were going to match with. Um, and, you know, know whether, you know, in kind is eligible, like your own, like, let's say you got a grant to put up fencing, you know, is your own labor in putting up that fencing an eligible match or not? Um, start early, prioritize tax tasks. Um, that's important. As I mentioned, give recommenders and partners adequate time to respond. Um, be prepared for the required record keeping. Um, most farmers didn't get into farming because they love paperwork. Um, so farmers are often not the best record keepers. Um, be aware that oftentimes grants come with record keeping. You have to document, you know, what was spent and what the results were and all that kind of things. And you know, it's good to have those record keeping systems in place before the grant period begins. Um, and sometimes it's actually not a bad thing necessarily. It sort of forces you to keep better records. Record keeping is really important to farming. Um, make your outcomes measurable if possible. Grant makers love quantifiable outcomes. Um, you know, how are you going to demonstrate that your product was effective? Um, Use clear and understandable language in your applications. The grant reviewers may not be from your industry. They may be from a nonprofit foundation somewhere. They might not understand your acronyms um, or specialized knowledge that you might use. Um, you know, make your proposal clear and concise. Get a second opinion if possible. Have someone review it. Um, look for errors in math. I um, worked on a grant with a farmer for... Um, it was part of the called the local food promotion program. They got a planning grant to build a food hub in, in uh, central New York state. Um, and they got a hundred thousand dollars awarded. Um, I did not do the budget in this case, but after we got the grant, uh, the project team found out that it, there was a $10,000 error in the budget and in, in not in our favor. <laughs> and so, um, we, we reached out to USDA and said, you know, we, we realized we made a mistake. You know, uh, of course we, you know, broke all the rules that I'm saying here and we did it like the last minute and all that other stuff um, and made an error. And the USDA was kind of understanding, but they were like, well, you know, this is what you said you're gonna do. So you're, you gotta do it essentially. So that's gonna, you know, essentially cost the, the farmer $10,000 that he didn't necessarily budget for, um, but he got a hundred thousand. So. All's well in the end, I suppose. Um, Jennifer mentioned this, as for feedback on unsuccessful applications, um, honest direct feedback is most constructive, learn from it and use it. So in summary, um, follow directions, be prepared to do the work, research, speak to their goals, um, make sure your project fits what they wanna do, look at previously funded projects, be realistic in your budgets and timelines, um, you know, as a, uh, as a rule of thumb, it, it usually takes longer and costs more than what you might initially think, whatever it is you're trying to do, Murphy's Law, right? Um, start early and prioritize, be prepared for the required record keeping, make your outcomes measurable, use clear language, get a second opinion when possible, and ask for feedback. Um, so having said all that advice, what, what is out there? So. Um, at Farm Credit East, we do a uh, grant report every year that we update. Um, it's due to be updated again. Um, but uh, it's grants and incentives for Northeast agriculture. So it's not grants from us, it's all the grants we could find out there from all different sources. We don't claim that it's comprehensive. There's, you know, right after we do the report, like a month later, there's something else that comes out that's not in there. Um, but we try to scour the web and find everything that we can and make it, you know, save you at least some time in terms of searching for grants. Um, not all of them are currently open for applications, but many of them repeat on an annual cycle. So if you look at it like value added producer grants or whatever, um, you know, the USDA is predictably gonna open those at the same time every year with about the same funding, you know, and the application is pretty much the same, you know, so you have an idea of what's coming. Um, and also look at MDAR as well. Um, you can go to that website, that uh, mass.gov slash AGR, 
And then there's a thing you can select agricultural grants and financial assistance um, and check that out and see what's currently open. Um, funders federal um, is the big the big tu uh, tuna. Um, USDA is the biggest one. Um, a lot of opportunities are passed through from USDA funding and as administered by states or nonprofits. Um, those are just a few of the alphabet soup agencies within USDA that fund grants. Um, MDAR offers quite a few grants or incentive programs. Um, and those are all available on their website. Um, nonprofits are often a source for usually smaller grants, but they're often easy to apply for. Um, they're often for specific types of farming or specific demographics. Um, they're often targeted and mission driven, like they're supporting, you know, sustainable agriculture by their definition of that, um, or certain types of farming. But, but if you meet those criteria, it can be worth pursuing. Um, utilities, there's uh, actually quite a few grants for utilities and energy efficiency if your farm uses energy in any significant way. If you have greenhouses or buildings or anything like that, um, there's a lot of money out there for efficiency and renewable energy. Um, so searching for grants, you know, web searching MDAR, you should all subscribe to the, the MDAR Farm and Market Report. Um, it's free. It comes out like once a month. And usually any new grants are announced in that as well as useful information for farmers, upcoming events, things like that. Um, and then just a note that many grants bring indirect indirect benefits to Northeast farmers. So when you're looking, excuse me, when you're looking at grants, you may find that you know some grants go to nonprofits or go to extension services or whatever else. But you know, uh, new entry sustainable farming itself is funded in large part by a by a number of grants, um, and that you know sort of trickles down and, and benefits farmers in an indirect way. So. Even if you don't get grants, you know, a check to yourself directly, know that you're benefiting indirectly in many cases from grant funding. Um, these are just a, specific, a few specific opportunities. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but the slides will be available. Um, I shared my a PDF of this with um, Mar Marit, and uh, I think she can send it out to anyone that asked for it. Um, and then uh, there's my contact information. If you have any questions after this, if you, you know, we're, we'll take questions now, but um, if you think of them later and uh, just search MDAR and um, you can find their, their grant page there as well. So I think I went over on my time, I apologize, but um, I'll let Jeff uh, take it away, I guess. Thanks, Chris. Um, I will probably not take what was planned for me time-wise. So let me share my screen. All right, everyone can see that. All right, I'm going to um, briefly go over who the Carrot Project is. Um, as you can see, we are looking to create a just and resilient food system. Our focus is in New England. Um, we address gaps. Uh, and in this particular time, the gap that we've identified geographically is southern New England. So uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island is our focus area geographically. Um, and we are looking to support uh, businesses that uh, uh, to create financial sustainability. And we have a number of ways of doing it. Um, we are in, here, in this work for the long haul. We're looking to uh, create a system and create businesses that are here for 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years from now even. Um, and, you know, if you're a farmer and you farm for 50 years, your body is probably broken and you're ready to pass on the business. And that's a great thing to do. Um, and part of what the Carrot Project is trying to do is helping farmers figure out a way they can transfer that business and retire. Right? So it's the financial planning that goes associated with this. Um, as Chris mentioned and Jennifer mentioned, uh, a lot of work uh, for nonprofits is uh, funded by grants. We solicit a lot of grant. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with grants. I've spent a lot of time with reporting on grants, but we do that so that the work that uh, we do can be provided to farmers at free or cost shared. And that's depending upon your location and your household income. 
Our core services are trainings and workshops like this. We have a loan program where we have a guarantee. We offer a guarantee uh, for loans up to two hundred uh, guarantees up to fifty thousand. But we do work with lenders up to two hundred fifty thousand, and we do direct one-on-one -on -one business advising and coaching. So, preparing for financing in our in our um, nomenclature. Um, Financing grants are just one form of financing and many of the uh, rules or best practices that apply to grants uh, apply equally to other forms of financing. Uh, and it's all based upon essentially in our opinion, what makes you a good risk or not. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of state and federal grants in particular. Uh, but first of all, I want to just go, what makes you good risk? Well, an updated business plan, um, it should set and track your goals, especially if you have good um, financial record keeping and spreadsheets to go with it. Um, it creates a system for you to focus on and evaluate what you're doing. And usually a business plan is critical for success, regardless of financing consistent and accurate record keeping be able to prove to yourself and to others that what you're saying in terms of your records and your financial reports and so on are accurate is usually critical and a good relationship with a bank um is is it's it's basically it's a reference right and if you're getting a reimbursement grant it could be that much uh more effective for you to be able to in your response or proposal to say hey i've got this bank i've got a line of credit if you give me this award i've already got the funding in place to get it implemented now the idea of risk um so think of it this way particularly with with government agencies they um would be or frequently are concerned about the investigative reporter of the local tv station or the you know the community TV station doing a report that somehow says XYZ gave X amount of dollars to this farmer and the money was totally abused and not used for how you know for its intended purposes and it was derived from public funds so that they've taken your tax dollars and thrown them away. Um, I can tell you for certainty that um, most um, government administrations are incredibly cautious about that uh, and will review grants for the potential that that might happen. Uh, and, and in fact, I will tell you, because uh, you can tell by my great beard, I've been for, around for a while. In Massachusetts, the Romney administration wasn't doing that. And they had this whole expose about a particular grant that they made and it was just a nightmare um and since that point in massachusetts um from what i know the governor office refused almost every single grant that's awarded um and so just be aware of that <clears throat> projections having good financial records and having good projections are almost always critical for receiving award there's always a budget component um uh, that's part of it. So, you know, having him the, the capacity, having your records up to date, having the capacity to create projections is critically important. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Chris mentioned um, the page limit on the narrative. Uh, frequently with federal awards, the budget and budget narrative don't count for the, the page limit. And so there can be the opportunity in your budget section to build and explain some of the intricate details of what you're trying to do if you have a really complex grant that you might not be able to otherwise fit into the page limit. So um, being, you know, just having that all, you know, ready to go in terms of having your, your projections and your numbers set forward can be really instrumental uh, in creating a great application. So ultimately what I'm trying to say is grant makers are betting on you and what's going to make you a good bet. That's what you need to ask yourself. That's what you're trying to try to focus on. So answering these questions will make you a good bet. Will 
Would this person or organization be able to complete the project? Will this person or business be able to fill the requirements set forward in the terms of the grant? Um, will it, as uh, Chris and Jennifer both said, uh, support the goals of the grant program? A business plan shows that you've thought about your business, where it is now, where it will go, or where you plan it to go, um, and how you'll get there. Uh, the, it's your financial projections, your financial reports will show you the use of funds. It will show what the grant will purchase, how it will affect your business and, and production and finances and so on into the future, all which can be important parts of the narrative um, for applying for the grant in terms of meeting a grantor's uh, objective. So um, what we are strongly advocating for is that for both funding purposes, as well as business management purposes, that you do consistent record keeping, consistent bookkeeping, you create and regularly update your business plan. And one way to do that in terms of preparing for grants is what we call the wish list method. Create a spreadsheet with the assets and expenses that you um, need and, and you want to do for growing your business. Um, assign it to a project, right? So you can keep it organized. In that, you list the amounts of things you need to buy. You create your links of, of where you're getting your prices so you can regularly update it. Um, and then if a financial opportunity arises, right, then what you can do is you can take, and literally, if you keep electronic records, and we strongly suggest the creation, creeping electronic records because they're easier to store, they're easier to share, they're easier to update. And in this case, my main point is they are easy to cut and paste from and put into a grant application. And both Jennifer and Chris talked about double checking, triple checking, make sure that you know, your spelling is correct, that your numbers are correct and so on. If you were doing this work and regularly up maintaining it, then it's very likely that through cut and paste, most of your information has already been vetted. And yes, you're gonna to need to have someone and yourself read the whole proposal and make sure it came together properly and well. Right. But a lot of the details have already been vetted and the cut and paste just lowers the burden that, that much more. Um, so ultimately, that's the core message that we want to say in terms of getting financing and grants in particular. If you set yourself as a regular practice of keeping your books up to date, keeping your business plan up to date, keeping your wish lists, all that information of what you want to accomplish and what you're going to use your funding for uh, up to date, then when a grant opportunity arises, and let's face it, frequently in the agricultural world, the grant opportunities are not posted until the government agency, if it's a government agency in particular, knows that the fiscal budget's been passed and they have the money to provide the grant. Uh, and in Massachusetts in particular, it can be a really short turnaround. Like you, you get a grant notice and uh, you know, March 15th saying, hey, this grant opportunity is available. The awards is gonna be before June 30th, theoretically. So therefore we need your response by May 10, I mean, April 10. Um, and so, so the point is they can be very, very short turnarounds when they're actually for awarded and if you've done your homework you've done the work in advance and maintain it and you can use the cut and paste method you have a reasonable chance of actually submitting a proposal um, given the fact that most farmers in this neck of the woods you know come the end of march are out doing farm work and don't have a lot of time to sit at a desk um, proposal so well that's the core message and here's some contact information um, we have uh, my, 
my coworker Amanda Chang, who is our expert on USDA, which should include USD loans and other opportunities. Um, and I put together, I'm the matchmaker. I put together all the services and, and connect folks with our uh, experts that we use to provide our technical support. Great, thank you, Chris and Jeff. That was awesome. Um, so this has been kind of a high level of like tips and tricks um, intro to Grant Writing 101. We wanted to open it up to all of you for questions and answers. And you know, what kind of burning, what were you expecting to come to this grant writing workshop and walk away with? Because it's hard, um, I just say it's hard to you know, we go through an example. Um, if folks would like, you know, like here's a, an RFR, we can go through like what would the section look like, how might you think about a response. We can break that into breakout rooms and folks can ask individual questions that they have, but we can do both of those things, but wanted to just kind of get some initial questions out and see what we didn't cover or what was unclear about sort of general tips and tricks. So this is your time to get what you came for, so let us know how we can continue to continue the conversation here. I do have a question, um, <clears throat> if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so at the end here, we we're talking a little bit about, um, you know, making sure your financials are up to date and your budget and so forth and um, looking ahead in the wish list. Are there any types of recommended tools to track, um, you know, how much produce you grow or how much you sell, like, or is it do what you can in Excel? Or, you know, are there some recommended tools um, out there that's for farming versus, um, you know, obviously there's lots of data tracking tools. Uh, well, yeah. I, go, ahead. Go, ahead, Jen, go ahead, Jennifer. Well, I would say quickly, um, last year we did a whole uh, 12 session workshop series on ag technology and software platforms that do a lot of that. We had some people workshops, some production tracking work, you know, workshops, and uh, financial tracking, market online marketing programs. So if you're interested in kind of a software platform that can do a lot of different things, um, maybe for production, or some of them are all inclusive too that do financial production, marketing, all right. that. So uh, if you look at our YouTube channel and look at our playlist in the Ag Tech Workshop series, okay, you can descriptions and, and learn about. Great. And Ag Squared and Farm OS and like there's there's a lot of different software that. Do Thank you. That's why I let you go first, Jennifer, because that's what I was going to say. But in addition to that, I will say, depending on the complexity, um, a spreadsheet. So we yeah. use Excel at the Carrot Project because it has some functionality that Google Sheets doesn't easily have. And, and you know, there's open offices, all sorts of software out there that creates spreadsheets. And so if you don't need to have a real complex right. you know, tracking system, um, you know, figuring out who is going to record the data, who is going, if you're going to create an electronic spreadsheet, who's going to enter the data, right? And where it's going to be saved, that's all critical to the process. But you know, spreadsheets can be a real effective tool um, okay. and are relatively inexpensive versus some of these platforms, which you, know, you pay for. Uh, of course. For, right. Um, the other thing um, that I think is important is that you trying to decide at what level of detail you're going to track um it, you know is important and and we like spreadsheets for a couple of reasons one you can put formulas in there and so you're not you know having to double check math and so on if it's math formulas um you can create search functions you know like in excel you can do the count if and a whole bunch of you know you have to learn the complexity of those those softwares but there's a whole bunch of functionality that can be built into it um and and make pulling the information out of it or seeing the information out of it um simpler versus you know hand hand ledgers i, I mean i know we work with farmers who say hey, i don't have the tools, I don't have the capacity, I don't have a computer, uh, I've got hand ledgers. And, and we we say something is better than nothing in all cases. However, it's such a nightmare 
to make adjustments for anyone who's old enough to actually have worked substantially with hand ledgers being the only record keeping system. It is so easy to make just one mathematical error in your addition and take hours to find it. Um, whereas spreadsheets, you know, basically can help prevent that happening. So that's that's why we say to folks, just it, first thing, invest in even a you know just a cheap computer and free software that's going to allow you to use um, spreadsheets. And there are financial accounting systems like QuickBooks, for example. Yeah. Right. Um, their budget process. So basically their projection process, it doesn't work. It's clunky, it's awkward, it's labor intensive. Um, and using a spread, an independent spreadsheet is much more effective and easier and less time can, intensive in our experience. Yeah, thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it. So we didn't talk a lot about how you search for grants. Um, I don't know if people have questions about that. Um, it's you know, a lot of different ways. I know Chris and, and might have touched on it a little bit. You know, you can do web searches. Sometimes that sends you down a rabbit hole. It's not always effective. Um, there, there is an organization in the Boston area called Associated Net Makers, and you know they do have a database of foundation grants and other grants and things like that. There's um, the foundation database group online. Some of these are membership based, so you may have to become a member to access the databases of foundations and grant sources and things. Sometimes you can get access to that through your public library. They may have a subscription to those databases. Um, you know, asking the librarian to help you research grant opportunities. That's you know, I think we underutilize our public library system, uh, but it's a great resource as well. Um, so there could be searches and things like that. I don't know if folks know about um, uh, what is it called? It's where you can look up people's um, not the kind of star and play spacing. They can put up um, foundations 1099s um, that they file as a nonprofit organization for 990s, right? They're 990s. Um, and you can go online and type in a foundation, look at their 990s, their tax filings as a nonprofit as foundation, you can see who they funded and how much they funded. It doesn't really give a whole lot of descriptions on their tax forms, but if you're curious about a foundation and you're not sure who they fund, and there's very limited information on their website. That's another way to sleuth around and figure out who they fund and how much they fund of different organizations. Find out a little bit more about them than you might be able to get, especially if people are not going to take your calls or answer questions. Um, so, you know, for our meeting, we've already shared some of the resources, and I'll certainly be in the follow up slides and things. But, you know, there's a lot of USDA grants um, learning to, to stay on top of them or suggesting maybe an annual calendar. Is helpful for these grants that come around year after year. They generally come out at the same time. So if you've already missed the deadline, putting it on your calendar to you know prep for it for the next next cycle is really helpful. But it's hard to give specific advice because everybody's always looking for different things for their unique arm and situation. But you just kind of have to. I also subscribe to a lot of newsletters, honestly, because different people post different things about grant opportunities. In different formats. So, as, as Kristen or Jeff, I can't remember who said it, but you know, subscribe to the MDAR or Mass Department of Ag Resources Farm Market Report. We'll certainly let you know about any of the Department of Ag Resources that are out there. Getting on the USDA um, listserv, they have a communications platform for USDA. You can subscribe to that and you'll hear about potential grant opportunities. So, comfood.org is community food systems. A lot of grant, you know, grant programs are posted there. Again, stay in touch with your farmer listserv, the EMAS craft listserv. I post farmer grants there whenever I can. So you're just subscribing to those um, listservs that, that will be places where you can find out when something is available. Hey, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, can I just share my screen and just do a quick uh, look at the, the MDAR grants page? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, 
you should be able to see this, hopefully. So I'm just going to search MDAR and it comes right up. And um, they have a agricultural grants and financial assistance program right there. So they have a whole bunch of different things here. Not many of them are open right now. Um, but as Jennifer mentioned, many of these will come up, you know, every year, that kind of thing. So let's just look at, you know, mark, um, marketing and promotion. So here we have, a, you know, a few of them. So specialty crop, ugh, specialty crop block grant program is a pretty good one. Um, Specialty crops are the USDA defines as uh, basically fruits and vegetables. That's what it boils down to. Um, you know, crops that are not like major row crops like corn and wheat and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, here they define what a specialty crop is. But, um, you know, these are all different types of responses. Um, you know, how to apply all that other stuff. Um, this actually might even be open now. Um, how to apply so you can put online. Yeah, so applicants must submit proposal by Friday, April 8th. Um, they have information sessions coming up, um, examples of eligible projects. They even give some in ineligible projects, um, contacts you can reach out to, um, you know, and that's just one of the grants, so list of awarded grants, that's a good one to look at. Um, so that's just, you know, one of them. Um, and, you know, it's worth spending a little bit of time, you know, taking a look and seeing what's out there. Um, farm improvement grants, here's another one. Um, farm viability uh, enhancement programming, you know, up to $150,000. Um, but again, you know, talk about strings attached. You have to sign an agricultural covenant for a 10 or 15 year term, depending on the amount of the grant. So that means basically you can't, pave it over and put up a car wash uh, for that period of time, or you'd have to pay back the grant, essentially. Um, and that's not open today anyway, but you know it's probably gonna reopen soon. Um, so grants for new farmers, mega. I know Jennifer might have some experience with that. So these are just all examples. And you know, again, not all of them are open right now, but um, you know, take a look at what's there. And you can even oftentimes ask you know, if we look at, um, you know, the mega web page, they even have a, a contact, you know, you can ask Jessica, hey, is this going to reopen at some point fairly soon? Um, it says the next RFR expected to be available and posted here early spring of 2023. That's probably the worst time for farmers, but that's when their schedule dictates it. So there you go. So I'll stop sharing, but that's just an example of a you know, and, and for those of you that are in other states, um, you know, look at your State Department of Agriculture is probably the best place to start. Thanks, Chris. That's super helpful. I, I have a question if I um, can ask it now. Sure, uh, go ahead, Danielle. I, I was wondering if you had any advice for farmers that are applying for grants without having very secure uh, a land or long-term land situation or don't already have a lot of capital just because I remember I was looking to apply to the mega grant and another grant um, offered by LEAF, I believe. And the mega grant, I um, think I remember you have to, be on land for one to three years already, which wasn't isn't my situation. And then the other grant, um, it was like I I was applying for money for a for a van, but I kind of already had to have money to apply for money. Um, so it's kind of, I it, yeah, I was wondering if you had advice to kind of it kind of maybe there's like a gap of I need the infrastructure already to be eligible for grants, but I need grants for the infrastructure. It's kind of like that double-edged sword. Sure. 
Jeff or Jennifer, you want to tackle that? Or I have some thoughts too I can share. Why don't you go first? Uh, and then, yeah, I can chime in. So my opinion is that I, I don't think you're going to be able to fund a for-profit farm on grants. The grants are like the icing on the cake. I think you need to have a plan that's going to be lucrative enough to support your goals by selling what you're going to produce. And then grants can be filling in here and there. That's just my two cents. I know that's maybe not a, the answer you wanted to hear, but that's just my thoughts. But Thank you. And I think the challenge with funding a very early stage farm business, as you're obviously experiencing, Daniela, too, is like it is tricky if you don't have secure land tenure. A lot of the um, pieces of infrastructure or the funding that you probably most need, you know, the funder is going to want to be able to be sure that you're going to have a place to execute that equipment, that project, that infrastructure for the life of, you know, for the depreciable life of that um, piece of equipment or infrastructure. And so that's, you know, part of what I think both the mega program that you might have applied to or any of the USDA, like the NRCS cost share programs, they require that you have a 10 year agreement, at least for the life of that conservation practice. Like for a high tunnel, it's at least three years, you know, three to five years, which Obviously, a high tunnel is going to last longer than that, but they're trying to make it at least a little bit accessible. But it's you are in a really tricky situation until you have some form of land security um, to make it both worth your investment of the time and energy and, and whatever, if it's not something that you can take with you at the end, um, but also to the funder. And so, yeah, it's, it's a little bit harder to figure out which comes first. Um, where, you know, do you have the funding? Do you have the land? But if you need to get those things and you need the resources to do it, um, it is a balancing act. And just to put in a quick little plug, we are trying to create, um, some of the students are online, a decision tool about exactly that thing, because it is so tricky. It's like, how do you decide what you need to do in which order and which grant programs could help you at which stage and what are all the things to think about. And so we're trying to put all that together in some kind of guide that will be a choose your own adventure sort of thing to help at least narrate and guide people through that decision-making process and where resources might be available at the different stages of, of investing and starting up your business. So we hope that will be useful. Um, we'd love some feedback as we're developing that. So we might reach out to some of you if you'd like to review an early draft of that when we're at that stage. Well, Danielle, along the lines of what Chris was saying, um, you know, sometimes it's just not feasible to support a for-profit farm with substantial grant funds. And so the solution uh, from our perspective is, is a loan typically, and Yes, you need to have land tenure to get most loans and so on, but let's putting that particular problem aside. Loans are frequently um, seen as the evil uh, you know, partner of, of, of farmers for some reason. Um, and I think I understand why, because the loan is very risky if you can't pay it back and they can own, you know, own your farm basically. So what we do as an organization is work with farmers to ensure that getting a loan is financially feasible. And that goes back to what I was saying before. It requires good record keeping. It requires a good plan. And it requires what we call a cash flow statement that proves conclusively that you can pay back the loan. And ultimately, if you can pay back the loan and make a profit and meet your business goals, then you've met the goals. You use someone else's money which can be ultimately less risky. Um, and then you get to the point where maybe you have some land tenure and so on because you've done well with it with, with the loan lending that you've had. Um, and and you can get some grants. So uh, that's you know that's our perspective at the Carrot Project. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Go ahead, Jed. I think we have two questions here. I just want to make sure that you all, so Serena, and then we have Randall. Hi, I was just curious about funding for um, a building or structure for the farm. Our building was recently burnt down by someone. So we have the land, but we don't have the building anymore. <laughs> 
And Serena, are you in a rural area or are you in an urban area? Urban. Okay, I was just gonna say, I know that the USDA Rural Development does have funding for certain building projects, but it's, yeah, they mostly fund in rural, rural communities. Um, um, go ahead, Chris. Sure, I was just gonna say, Serena, um, the, the, the first question I would ask is what what's the purpose of the building like what are you what are you going to do with it and and how is that going to benefit your operation and that would be the the, the key thing to matching up with a grant um, if that's what you're going to go after so if it's like a packing facility where you're going to like pack produce for distribution somehow um, you know that could be applicable to certain types of grants or if it's you know, an educational facility, maybe that could be useful to some other thing. Okay. Um, it really depends on what you're, what you're, you know, like just to get saying, I want a building, like is probably not going to get you anywhere. Like, <laughs> you know, right. not, not to be flip, I'm just, you know, you need to, <laughs> what you're going to, what, what's the end goal of like, what's that building going to help you get to? Well, that wasn't being a flip, that was being straightforward. <laughs> And, you know, I mean, that's the best answer because then I know how to move <laughs> forward. Um, but my, I mean, it would be for a packing space and, you know, office. And there are more and more programs and grants out there that are supporting your urban agriculture. Um, so I don't know of a lot of specifics, but um, I think that there's stuff out there. Maybe um, Jennifer or Jeff might be able to speak to it more. I'm not sure. If you're in Massachusetts, um, we definitely have the, the Department of Ag Resources has their Urban Ag Grant and um, Rose Arruda will be speaking on that in one of our other workshop series. And then the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service has an Urban Ag Grant. Those are more for kind of larger scale planning projects and collaborative community, you know, implementation projects and things like that, but that could be something to look at as well. Um, the Mass Food Ventures program also supports capital equipment and construction projects in urban areas if it's around, you know, generating new food related businesses that also support and benefit local farms. So those are just a few examples, some state specific, but some, you know, potentially federal as well. But I think USDA has made a huge shift in the last five to 10 years in recognizing urban agriculture as a viable, important contributor to ag. And so some of their, they're being more, they're trying to bring on the rest of the agency to say, hey, we gotta pay attention to this. So there's being more, there's certainly more funding available than there ever has been. So it's good, good timing. Thank you. Randall. Yeah. Yes. Um... A question about like legal definitions or I don't know, like the um, base my, my thing is a sole proprietorship. Um the money that's coming in and out of my operation is like pretty small, frankly. And my accountant has always counseled me not to get an LLC or S Corp or anything like that. Um does that present a problem for grants like am I more likely to get something if I can say like oh here's a um these different numbers or I don't know I'm, I'm wondering how much I should professionalize to get grant money basically I guess I would say usually not um like being a sole proprietor is not, not usually an obstacle mm -hmm. um but you want to make sure you're filing a schedule f and showing farm income mm -hmm. that, that shows that you're like a farm you know yeah. Um, and even if it's not, you know, whatever amount it is, it is what it is, but you know, that would show a track record of like having an ongoing operation and, and that sort of thing. Not, you know, I don't think you necessarily for grant purposes need to be incorporated or that sort of thing. I I've seen both sole proprietors, even fairly larger op operations being sole proprietors, um, and entities get grants kind of equally, I guess. That's just my, my perspective, which obviously is limited. <laughs> okay, good. That, that's good to know. Cause yeah, I do have the, that, the F schedule with my taxes and stuff. And I did apply for a grant last year and um, I just gave them, yeah, you know, what, what ended up being my social security number saying and showing them the thing. And it, it didn't seem like a problem, but I couldn't tell if they were like pitting me or what. <laughs> but, okay. Thank you. I appreciate it.
Randall, it really depends on, again, the advice was make sure you really understand the application. It, typically, you'll let you know. Um, and I just want to comment that from my perspective, a sole proprietorship is a professional business. You don't have to have a different legal mm -hmm. structure to uh, to have a real business, so to speak, and, and operate it professionally. So, um, you know, just a little little bit on that, I guess. I think I would just add, um, you know, there are a lot of great resources that like um, Farm Commons and the Legal Food Hub have about business entity formation and reasons that you may want to consider a different entity in terms of liability and protecting your assets. But, you know, as Jeff said, you can successfully operate your business professionally as a sole proprietorship. It's also just how do you want to structure, you know, things and you do want to be more protected and separate your business as a separate entity from your personal assets and other things. Um, as a sole proprietor, you are your business. So everything you own <laughs> can be subject to the whims of a lawsuit and other things. So those are just things to keep in mind. But getting legal counsel to see if it makes sense, I think is is helpful, but there's nothing wrong with staying, staying how you are. I agree with everything uh, you said, Jennifer, and I will add again from the carrot perspective, pushing the pencil and doing the financial analysis of if you're sole proprietorship, you can protect yourself with insurance if you have enough dollar limit of insurance to cover all of your assets. And so pushing the pencil to see what's cheaper filing an LLC for $500 a year, plus all the paperwork and time and drag and all that kind of stuff versus your insurance premiums. Um, coupled with the fact that even if you have an LLC, it's likely you're gonna still want to have insurance. It may not need to be quite as robust as it would otherwise be if you're a sole proprietorship, but it's not like you're trading off typically insurance and no insurance by going with an LLC. Great, thanks, Jeff. Other questions? Yeah, I wasn't sure if I if I caught this earlier, so I apologize if I missed it. Um, in terms of how to just kind of detect those general operating grants versus the programmatic, you know, usually the grants that I've read and similar to what you're all sharing is usually have a, a very clear objective in mind that they're looking, you know, in terms of um, the outcomes that they're looking to, to have. Um, is there certain organizations that you know do offer general operating versus some more of the specific programmatic types of um, objectives? Is it MDAR, is it, you know, US, um, USDA, is it, you know, maybe more foundations? Are you are you for profit or non profit, Beth? Non profit. Okay, so then you you have a chance. I was going to say if you're for profit and you want just operating funds, I don't know anything out there. Yeah. For non profit. <laughs> non profit. There are, yeah. Um, there are some foundations that recognize that project funding is limiting for non profits because yeah. they need to build capacity. Um, but even there, it's limited. Um, and that's like the holy grail of, of grant seeking. Um, and I'm sure Jennifer can attest to that as well. Um, one key is any is anytime you're getting project funding, be sure you're maxing out like the, the, the sort of overhead that supports that project, if you will, um, and, and work that into the budget. Um, and as Jeff said, you know, ask each time, or sorry, Jeff's talking about something else in the chat. Um, but yeah, I don't have a specific answer for you. Okay. Um, can weigh in. Yeah, I would say, yeah, general operating is the hardest of the hard to find. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I would say foundations are more likely to be open to that and state okay. and federal grants, zero Not chance much. usually. Yeah, that. yeah. More, yeah. But I would say there are creative ways, again, within the confines of any of those other grant opportunities, like build in the, the operating costs as if, you know, I mean, the project, you need to be yeah. able to directly tie what everybody yeah. in the organization is doing to that project. If right. you can justify why you need to support this person and they're asking you for these records, include a portion of the accountant's time, include a portion of, yeah. you know, whoever's time is going to be writing the reporting. Like those are all legitimate costs to execute right. 
the project that you're asking for. Unfortunately, sometimes with a lot of the state grants and whatever, if they're just for capital, you know, even though it takes like, even if there's this other objective about food security or feeding the hungry or whatever, and you buy this van, mm-hmm. but like, who's, who's spending the time to like, research, right. you know, buy it and do this and report that and deliver the food, but it's all got to be wrapped up and described in the project in order to get the van. Like, exactly. But running the actual project and achieving the outcomes still takes other people time, but sometimes they just don't fund it. So it's, it's, it is hard. Yeah. And just for the recording too, Emily asked in the chat if it's okay to reuse letters of reference for multiple applications or if it's best practice to ask people over and over again for these. I would say, you know, as Jeff said, it's best practice to ask each time. And it's also really helpful to reference specifically the project that you're asking for. So, you know, I, I we do tons of letters of support. Many of the farmers on this call from New Entry have been asked for them multiple times. But like, you know, I also try to do the best to write, to prepare a template for partners to say, here's what I'd like you to say. So that it makes it easy to ask them over and over again. And, you know, you can put the name of the funder on there, change the date dear so-and-so, it's like very personalized. This is the name, the title of the grant that we're applying for. This is the project period we're doing. This is specifically what we're doing because that goes a long way to show the funder that you're, you really do have support for that project. And it's not just a dear John letter that's very generic. Um, and so I write a template and I always email it to the person. I'm not gonna falsify a letter on their behalf um, and give it to them and say, please make any edits or changes. Like I started this for you because I want to make this quick and easy. You know, up, you know, put in your own little testimony here. I'll put in a little thing to highlight it and say, add this here, add this here. But this is the gist of the grant. This is the scope of what I'm we're doing. You know, are you comfortable with this? Send it on, put it on your letterhead, sign it and send it back to me. And just give them plenty of time to turn it around. But yeah, I do ask people every time because. Usually I have to tweak it a little bit to be more specific. Other questions? Has anyone on the call um, applied for a grant and received one or equally applied and been rejected and wanna share their story? Lessons learned. I can. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't a federal grant, though. So it was a grant that required some crowdfunding. So I had to do some fundraising first, and then they matched the. They matched the grant. Um, it wasn't a, a big amount, but. It was interesting to do and write in the stuff. And of course, like most people, I did it at the last minute. They're like, okay, time is up today. And after I submitted it, they extended it for a day. So, um, but we did receive that. So that was pretty cool. That's great. That's a great example of like leveraging other resources and having more community support to leverage crowdfunding to get a grant. That's awesome. And I think uh, Chris had another um, ex- a little thing, and I don't know if we articulated it loudly enough too, but just about waiting till the last minute. This has happened to us before as well, but like when everyone in the world is trying to put in an online application at the last minute, sometimes they crash or sometimes there's errors in the system. So again, like not waiting until the hour before it's due. I worked on a proposal with another organization for three weeks. I like stayed up all night long for a few nights before it was due. The day, and I'd asked for a month ahead of time, make sure we have all the SAMs and the DUNS and this registration and your grants.gov login, all this stuff. We got all the letters of support. It was 100% matching fund. It was like a half a million dollar grant, tons and tons of time. I'm giving a workshop that day, checking, checking, checking. Turns out the organization that had to submit the grant didn't have the right login for the grant application portal. 4.59 rolls around, it's due at five o'clock. We're scrambling, the executive director's in New Orleans at a conference, we're trying to get the password, whatever, whatever. The grant got submitted at 5.07 p.m., never got reviewed, <laughs> nothing. Didn't get in on time, 
you know, weeks and months and hours of my life gone. So it's just like that stuff can happen so easily. Um, or if you log on and think you have everything and all of a sudden it asks for 12 more things that you didn't know because you maybe you didn't make a checklist or there were hidden things that weren't clear in the RFA, but were on the online form or you wrote this whole beautiful thing and then all of a sudden you, the character limits pop up and you've got to reduce it by a tenth of what you wrote. It's really hard to be concise in a short amount of time. So yeah, just Chris mentioned that and I was like, oh yeah, I have horror stories <laughs> of waiting to the last minute or somebody else waiting to the last minute and it sucks. Sorry, someone else is gonna share their grant story. Um, I have a grand story I can do real quick if no one else. Um, so I've always assumed that this stuff just didn't, I didn't qualify for it. Um, and last year I applied for the grant that someone sent me and it was, I can't remember exactly what it was for. I think they were saying it was um, like food systems and uh, communities and I don't, this other kind of stuff. And I'm like, I don't think this is me. I'm just like a beekeeper who sells honey. And I do like presentations for kids and like demos and that, that sort of stuff. And I was like, I was really trying to like fit that square peg in the round hole, you know? And I knew I was like, I don't know if this works or not. And so I've, I've never done anything like this before. Um, put together, like, like printed out my, basically my books and like, included that as my budget and stuff and then just came out with like a very basic thing and what I wanted the money for is like I bought a house a couple like last year I guess and I want to build out my garage into a honey shop and that's going to be expensive and so I was trying to get money for that but of course it's just being like my property they weren't um that wasn't what the thing was for you know so I, I kind of did this thing and it was like up to 15 grand and I just kind of like made up some numbers and I was like I'm couple grand of equipment and some contractors and some stuff and put it as like 13 grand or something I think it was like a little bit um humble and they sent me a really nice letter because clearly a nice response like clearly I didn't know what I was doing um but they ended up saying like I didn't really qualify it didn't really match the spirit of what they were doing but they're like here's two thousand dollars because I saw that you had a wooden beekeeping equipment line and we'll give you two thousand dollars for that and we're like okay so so I, I kind of just kind of learned a little bit about it but i still got some money and you know that's why i'm like well i think there might be something here for for me that i didn't think i qualified for before so that sounds like a really amazing funder so you were lucky to match up with that opportunity so congratulations yeah, yeah. thanks and I think that's a good lesson too, that, you know, sometimes when you apply for, you know, a whole project, if the funder has the flexibility, they might just fund a partial portion of it. And you also have to be okay if that's an option for you. You can always say no to the money, but sometimes saying yes to something is better than, you know, not getting everything you wanted. So yeah, that's a great example. Do we have any other questions? Otherwise, Kimberly, I can turn it back over to you to give folks some, some time to fill out the final evaluation. And I'd love to thank um, Chris and Jeff and uh, Marit and Maddie and the other students that are on the phone, uh, Jenny and others that are working on this project and, and Kimberly for spearheading everyone uh, to put this series together. And thank you, Jeff and Chris for speaking tonight and sharing your information and to all of you for attending and learning and doing the great work that you do out in the communities, growing food and um, connecting other people to it. So, Kimberly. Thanks. Uh, thank you all to our panelists, Jennifer, Chris, and uh, Jeff. It's been very informative. Um, and I appreciate you taking time on this. Uh, I feel like it's Wednesday, right? <laughs> uh, today's the hump day here. Um, but in terms of the workshop here, this is our first one of the series. So I just put into our um, into the chat bar there just to let you know what's happening. Um, and we actually have for the month of January, we have two more coming up. So um, unlocking unlocking Massachusetts money for your farm, digging deeper into MDAR grants and financial assets. That's going to be our next grant on 
Wednesday, uh, excuse me, on Monday, not Wednesday, um, six to eight, the same time frame. And uh, there will be a hybrid component to that. I'm going to be sending out emails if you uh, tonight to see um, both if you want to go face to face or if you would prefer to do the Zoom option. Um, but yeah, check out those elements or those additional options and sign up, please, if you'd like. Um, but uh, just a round of applause or virtual applause to our presenters and thank them for taking the time for answering all your wonderful questions. And, uh, and thank you all for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. I will say as you log off here, um, we're going to have a little short survey I had mentioned earlier. Um, and um, But hopefully you learned something. And please feel free to reach out to New Entry. We will be posting. Um, the recording of this workshop, as well as some additional resources that our uh, speakers talked about. Um, we also will be building out some additional elements that you'll see within the uh, our new entry website to tie to these particular workshops. So keep an eye out for those. But if you certainly have questions, you can contact me. I'll just type type into the to the chat here, um, and I'm the one that's been emailing you. Um, but thanks all for coming. And if anyone has any additional last thoughts, comments, concerns. All right. Well, enjoy your Wednesday evening and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.